Welcome. There's still some seats over here for those of you who don't have one yet. All right, welcome and good evening. I'm SC. I'm the founder of Products That Count. It's very exciting to see all of you tonight uh, during the holidays. Great crowd, so thank you for coming. Who's been here more than once? About half. Who's been here three times this year? About a third. Who's been here five times or more this year? Okay, about 10%. You guys are members that count. <laughs> yes, we have this program. We love it when people come like more than you know, five times or more. So we have this program called Members That Count. If you come five times in a year, we invite you to our holiday party, we give you 20% off of every event of the following year, and you get a really cool card. So I hope that you will come uh, at least five times this year. Anyway, so first thing I want to do is thank our sponsors. First sponsor is Yelp. Yelp has been hosting us from day one in San Francisco. They are amazing. They are providing this incredible space. They are providing our food. They are an amazing company to work for. If you are interested in careers at Yelp, there's a Yelp sign, red sign, just behind you over there, and you can talk to Rebecca at the end of the event, and she'll answer your questions. And just in case you're wondering, they're hiring, you can cross over. They're hiring product people, analysts, marketers, and engineers. Um, second sponsor I want to thank tonight is WeChat. WeChat is the Facebook of China. I am like incredibly lucky to uh, have them as one of our partners. They've been phenomenal. We have a WeChat channel um, for products that count. If you haven't tried WeChat, I know it's this like Chinese thing with 800 million people, <laughs> users. If you haven't tried it yet, I really encourage you to, to give it a shot. It's really the future of mobile. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, and I also encourage you to subscribe to our channel because uh, starting next week, we'll be offering a few uh, free tickets to TechCrunch Disrupt in a few weeks through our WeChat channel. Um, and then the third sponsor I want to thank, uh, partner I want to thank is Pragmatic Marketing. They offer amazing trainings. Uh, we love what they do. It's high quality. It's really great stuff. They have a training that comes up in San Francisco, uh, September 18 to 20. I encourage you to go to their website, pragmaticmarketing.com, and check it out. All right. And with that, I want to introduce our speaker, Caitlin. So I first met Caitlin because I read her piece in the first round review uh, about prototyping, which is the topic of her talk tonight. I was really impressed. And I was uh, so impressed that I reached out to her. We started chatting, and uh, I was impressed with like how she uh, has thought about her frameworks and how she delivers the presentation. So I'm very, very excited to hear her talk tonight. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you so much, uh, SC. So, all right. All right, so I'm here to talk about how you can turbocharge the development of your products um, using the craft of prototyping. And prototyping helps you focus your energy on the right things at the right time in your product development process. And when you're doing that, um, that's the secret to making great products, in my opinion, is not wasting energy in the wrong places in the wrong time, is knowing where you are in your process and investing the right energy in the right places. So uh, before I do get started, I wanna take a moment to thank Products That Count and SC for having me here today. Um, and also to Oculus and Facebook for letting me do what I love. So I wanna take a quick poll of who's in the audience, because I have no idea. Who are folks working in the software world? Okay, most of you. Is anybody in hardware or consumer electronics Yes, okay, so we have some folks. What about marketing? Um, no, yes, okay, a couple folks, great. And how many of you folks are working in the Bay Area? Okay, um, I hope that you will save up questions. I love questions, I especially love hard questions. So we're gonna have a and a in the end. Um, and so save them up, and really anything you wanna know, let me know. 
Um, it's something that we do at Facebook is encourage hard questions, and I have yet to be in the front of of uh, audience when I'm asking for some. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so when I joined Oculus in 2014, my team was sweating on a really unique challenge. We were to design the controllers that would go with the hotly anticipated Oculus Rift. Um, this is, a, as you probably know, Oculus Rift was a virtual reality headset, and so uh, it was acquired by Facebook um, at that time. But VR was uncharted territory. There weren't really VR products out yet. Um, there wasn't precedence for what this hardware should look or feel like either because of that. So working with the industrial designers led by Peter Bristol, we have a Seattle studio where a lot of this work was done, um, the team began to weigh factors that would determine how the product would ultimately feel. We wanted our controllers to fit a broad swath of people from the fifth percentile female to the 95th percentile male. And when you really look at uh, body modeling, that's a huge difference. The fifth percentile female is pretty tiny. The 95th percentile male is, is pretty huge. Just a head size, we have these foam models in our office. Like it's kind of like this size to like this size, basically, in head circumference. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty major um, difference. And so you had to grip this thing without being able to see it, because you're in VR, you can't see anything, know where the buttons are, and intuitively know what's going on. Um, in addition to that challenge, we had to put sense uh, infrared LEDs, so you can't see the light, but it's always going off and sense it by an external sensor. And no matter what you do, you can't get in the way of those light signals. So this was a pretty challenging, challenging uh, design for us. Each new parameter complicated the other. The overall weight and the weight distribution, the number of buttons, the strap, how you're gonna hold it, the team iterated over and over and over. And actually this is one of the early prototypes um, of an actual prototype of one of our early concepts. Um, this is where the magic happens in this iteration, in this ugly space. Um, some prototypes were so ugly, they were just a tube of plastic with putty stuck on it, or you know, uh, cut, out, uh, cut out foam core made into different shapes. Um, but by the end of this uh, process, this product iteration cycle, We'd created a controller that a user could actually open their hands on without dropping the controller. And they can't see it. So they're able to just naturally grab something, close their hands, and, and pick it up. And sensors that allowed you, when you took your fingers off the buttons, to know that you were giving a thumbs up or pointing. And that hadn't been done before. We'd iterated enough times that when we reached the engineering validation build, or EVT, uh, the physical proportions of the controller were nearly perfect. And the only thing that we had to adjust was the circumference of the ring by a tiny, tiny amount. So what I want to talk about today is the craft of prototyping and the principles that I've learned about how to make prototyping work for you. These principles um, can help you make any product, not just hardware, software, hardware, user experience, um, a combination of all three. And let's go back to the very beginning of the product process. You are all familiar with it, I'm sure. It's the time when you are just starting to build your product. It's the time when there are no deadlines yet, when your investors aren't clamoring, when your execs aren't asking for status yet. The stakeholders are patient and the customers are not yet clamoring for this product. And this is when you have to get super, super clear about what goals you will not bend or budge on. Before starting your design work, you need to define what your product absolutely must do, table stakes before you'll ship it. And most of the time, I see people do this right before they're about to miss on some things they thought they wanted to do because they're running out of time. But if you wait that long, you're going to have to make the wrong trade-offs, and you won't have the right frame of mind. So my first principle is to define your non-negotiables. While the Oculus Touch controllers 
are my most recent project. My first product was the OQO Model 2. Does anybody remember it? Okay, there is a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad you do, though. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to take you way back to 2005. 2005 was pre-smartphone, so we were still texting with 777-22333. I don't know if some folks might not remember that in the audience. <laughs> it was very painful. Um, OQO, which was right down on 20th and Harrison in the Timbuktu factory now, um, we miniaturized a fully functional PC into a palm top. This is when laptops were still big and bulky. There weren't ultrabooks yet even. And uh, this thing ran a full version of Windows. Um, it was before its time in a lot of ways. It had a full keyboard, broadband, and a weight of less than one pound. But there were a few perfectionists at the company. I'm sure some of you work with perfectionists. Some of us are perfectionists. And some things weren't quite right on the product. So we kept redesigning and redesigning and redesigning. And I remember at one point, see the chassis there, we were over 100 revisions of the part. And there were only two digits, so we had to pull a new part number. That's how much revision they were doing. And once the Model 2 finally came out, it was April 2007. Does anybody else remember what product came out around <laughs> April 2007? The iPhone, the first iPhone, which is just fundamentally a tiny PC that's not that good killer, right? And we could have shipped probably a year before. So three months after iPhone, I think, was announced. So we'd missed our ship window with a product battery that lasted less than an hour. That's why you don't remember the product. <laughs> Now, new companies are often under a lot of pressure. Right? They don't always define these non-negotiables clearly at the beginning, so they get backed into a corner. And I'm sure we've all been forced to ship before we're ready um, without having met those critical benchmarks or delayed shipment for the wrong reasons in retrospect. And that's very, very painful. So number one, number one principle, boil the most critical elements of the product down in the beginning. So one or two key features. It's difficult, but if you do it, you keep everybody focused on the right things at the right time. And if you don't nail those, you decide not to ship the product. So in the early 2000s, Steve Jobs had this idea. Um, this was, I don't know exactly what year, but many, many years before the iPad came out and years before the iPhone came out. He wanted to have a digital book that you could hold and read. Um, and he had this vision that really was the iPad. And so all these engineers in the company were mo mobilized, this ta kind of tech team force inside of um, uh, the Mac PD group, actually. And they kept bringing in prototypes, prototypes, every six months, every year, a new prototype. Every single time he picked it up, and I'm making this up, but I feel like he probably threw it across the room and he was like, this is too heavy. Every single time. That was his non-negotiable. He knew what the iPad had to do. If it was too heavy, you couldn't hold it, you couldn't keep it in your hands for long. Um, it took Apple seven years to ship the iPad before they got that right. Seven years. And the iPhone was discovered in the process. A few years into the iPad development, they were like, oh, we could use these components to make a different product, and they made the iPhone. But they still kept working on the iPad until it was ready to ship. And this is why this is such a critical, um, a critical one. The next principle that I've got for you today is let the product drive your development style. There is no one-size-fits-all product development process. It doesn't exist if you find it uh, don't tell anybody, mint it, <laughs> you'll be a billionaire. Um, there isn't one. I would argue there isn't one. So I'm going to talk about two main things you do have to consider to know, OK, where, how are we going to build our product development style? And this is a, a sort of a slider that I, that I made up. On the left-hand side is caution. On the right-hand side is speed. And you do not get to be on both sides of this. You have to pick a place. And this is something that I think you also need to do super early. Which way you tilt on this depends on your company, what you're trying to accomplish, 
where you are in your development cycle. If you're schedule driven and trying to beat a competitor to market, you're going to slide away from caution over to speed. So you're going to come this way. Um, if you're making a product with a lower volume, like 100 of something versus 2 million or, or fewer customers, you can change your risk tolerance. You can absorb more last minute changes. At Apple, when I was developing the MacBook Air, I'm going to be far more cautious about risk. This is a huge high volume product in hardware. You've got huge you know, presses and machines making all these parts. It's really expensive to recover from mistakes. And the further into the product development cycle you get, the harder and harder it is by orders of magnitude. Okay. But if I'm designing the first VR product, I'm going to use less caution. I'm going to be more ambitious. My early volumes will be more manageable, and I can move faster and fix problems in flight. And also, in a new industry, you're not sure what's going to work yet. So you have to stay as nimble as possible, in my opinion. So next piece of this is you have to understand where you are in order to master your trade-offs properly. So if I'm making a medical product, for example, my caution slider is generally all the way to the left. They take much longer to develop, uh, achieve compliance, there's health, safety, and I want to be very, very careful about that. And your management of your team should also shift accordingly. If you're super cautious, encourage all assumptions to be checked and double checked. So tell your team to confront each other about things. Ask, is this true? Is there enough swell space for this battery? Is the flame rating right for this part? Are you sure? Have we tested it? And have we checked that the manufacturer hasn't changed the material on us three months into the run to lower their costs? When speed is the top concern, only worry about the most critical issues. In those cases, I give a piece of paper to my team, and I say, make a list of all the design issues you are worried about in ranked order. And then I rip the page under the first five, and I say, just focus on those. Once you've figured out your place, on this caution speed slider, you're ready to start building prototypes. Your singular goal is to iterate as much as possible before the ship date. So third, we're going to solve the hardest problems first. I think this is the one that we all kind of know and that we almost never actually do. But if, we, but if you do it, it'll save you a lot of pain. So if you take a typical engineer and you show them a problem and you say, I don't know if this is possible. Can you try it? They're usually all in. And this is kind of what I'm talking about in the very beginning. My former colleague, Doug Field, uh, who was my VP at Apple and now runs engineering at Tesla, had a really useful uh, way to think about design effort that I'm going I'm to show you here. And it's kind of a, a, a time and effort graph. So most people increase their effort and focus as the product develops, which is this red curve. You guys see it? Am I standing in front of my slides? <laughs> you just holler for me to move if you want. That's cool. Um, so, so let's just kind of break this down. On the red side, so you start out with the easy stuff, the stuff that you know. And as you get closer and closer and closer to the big kind of va validation test, you say, uh-oh, this isn't fixed. Let's pour more people on this. Uh-oh, this isn't fixed. Let's invest more over here. And by the time you're through here, you don't have that much ability to make changes, no matter how much money or time, or how, how much money or people you throw on it. It's too late, usually. But people do anyway. All the way up to the end, when there's a problem at the end that's a stop ship problem, I've seen probably millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions. Actually, I have seen hundreds of millions of dollars spent right here two months before ship, one month before ship, to, to save a ship date. That's not where we want to be. So your effort um, needs to peak at the beginning, which is hard to mobilize a team around. Um, but you really want to go through crazy, crazy amounts of work right there. Put the best people you have on it and do all that hard grinding early. Um, Take one thing at a time with your prototypes and begin with the gnarliest challenge. So I'm going to kind of break that down. It seems really simple. People don't usually actually do it. So dedicate the most time to the hardest thing. 
and start to layer in easier things as you go. So what are you doing that nobody else has done before? The thing that maybe you're not sure you can do at all. That's where you wanna focus your initial prototyping energy. And you're also gonna be revving up your engineers by giving them a really meaty problem to solve first. So this brings us into the next one, which is important. Um, build ugly prototypes. Uh, make seriously ugly prototypes. Why? You're focusing on the toughest engineering problems first. You don't need to worry how it, about how it looks yet. But there's also a hidden benefit. When something's really ugly, people don't fall in love with it, especially influential people inside a company. Have you ever brought something to an executive and wanted to change it later? And they don't want to change it because they're so locked on that thing that they saw that they love. Um, it's worse if it's physical, I promise. If you show them something that's physical, they can lock onto it. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but you kind of take a swag at what something might cost, like an MSRP or a price, and you put it on a slide. And then 12 months later, the exec keeps, or the leader keeps talking about that price that it's going to be, and you've completely changed your plan. It's the same kind of idea. So don't give any people anything to anchor to until you're ready. It's detrimental to your process. Add polish when you're selling something. Add polish when you're close to done. So a strategy for guarding a product's potential is to keep your prototypes and early ideas ugly longer. It gives you a lot more flexibility. And then you start to braid in other hard things as you progress. You don't need to do everything at once, and you shouldn't. So with touch, with the Oculus Rift controllers, they're called touch, the team started with a general shape. It wasn't this one. It was, I don't know, something like that. That's what we started with, basically. And then, over time, we took a shape that we knew was ergonomic and trackable, and we started to iterate. Once that was pretty close, the, sh the diameter of the grip, uh, the diameter of the ring, the location of the trigger, and the grip trigger, um, we moved into details around those details around buttons and input. With the electrical innards and sensors, those were split off in a completely other prototype that wasn't even like this at all, just to show it worked. That was a separate set of prototypes that we then braided together once we had both pretty close. Proving everything could fit, and this is the final product. Um, my next to last rule is converge quickly or reset. This principle keeps you from following the wrong path for too long, and it has to do with listening to your team as well. So too much prototyping can be a bad thing. You can, like what I talked about with OQO, you can sense when you're on the wrong track, when you're on this red line. So on the x-axis, these are the number of attempts it takes, the number of iterations. And on the y-axis is basically how close are you getting to the top line, which is your goal. When your iterations start to yield these tiny incremental improvements, and you are not converging towards your goal, you really need to stop and step back. Um, you need to change the initial goal, sometimes that's the right thing to do, or change your assumptions. Scrap the plan, back up, find a different way to solve that problem. If you wait too long to rip the Band-Aid off, it can get so expensive you lose your chance to reset. Okay, so the Mac Pro. This is a crazy product in a lot of ways. Um, this is an impact extruded, and actually an impact extrusion is pretty rad. You take a billet, like a little disc of aluminum, and you hit it really, really, really hard in the middle until it slowly starts to extrude out a can like this, and that's an impact extrusion. But we did it for a computer, which I'm fairly confident I can say that nobody's ever done that before. <laughs> so that's an impact extrusion that got post machine polished. It's crazy. Um, hardware people are laughing because this is crazy. Um, and then this, the innards, the thermal heat sink is actually an extrusion. Um, and the original plan was to have the outside and the heat sink, which is kind of a triangle with extruded fins, all extruded in one piece. And the industrial design team at Apple was like all about this. And so we worked for probably four months to get this to work. And at the time, the leadership wasn't 
making the call to make a change. And so we probably lost some real, really important time. And uh, at the time, my manager was uh, Matt Casebolt, who's now also at Tesla, and he made the call to stop. We wanted to make the industrial designers happy, but at a certain point, if you're not converging, you need to make that call. And so we did. We cut the outside and the inside into two extrusions, and it was still incredibly rad. So it worked out okay. Um, too little prototyping can also be a bad thing. Your engineers will kind of get worried. They'll get uneasy. That's a warning sign that you're moving too fast. This also applies to, to coders and designers, 2D designers. Encourage your team to tell you bad news, though, by improving your response to bad news. Be sure to actually do something about it. Be open and welcoming to bad news. I think we've all worked with folks who kind of get upset or blame. And you're not going to ever teach your team to come bring you things if you behave that way. And this goes double for vendors, especially vendors who might be from a different culture. I generally work with Chinese vendors, and they'll, they won't tell you anything unless you train them over time that you're not going to yell at them or get upset, basically. Um, be sure to do something about it. Connect people. Call a meeting. Make it known. You'll do everything you can to support your team in fixing the problem. Spend just the right amount of time prototyping. Engineers never feel like the product's done. Ever. We don't. We're never ready to ship. Team leaders can be okay with shipping with a few minor issues, but engineers will struggle with it. My strategy with this is to say, don't worry, we're going to get this right in the next round, in the next product, in the follow-on, and start working on that. Let the engineer know you care and you want to get it right, but the product needs to get out the door. Um, and worst case scenario, you can fix, at least in the hardware world, after you ramp. So after that, after that first month or two of volume goes out. Ending these iterations, these iterations really close to your ship date is very, very dangerous because of all the interdependencies, especially with hardware, but this is true with software as well. Before you make changes, go back and revisit your non-negotiables and prioritize you can really cause a lot more problems than you're solving by fixing things last minute. Those small changes could break the whole thing. Um, and then the last one, iterate like crazy. This is how you get from good to great, even if everything else is done perfectly. You have to have everything right on paper first, like price, features, ship date. But if you miss things like texture, like click feel, like sound, Usability flow, the minutiae that give the experience that glow, you'll never get a product that people fall in love with. And I think we all have products that we are in love with in our lives, and I'm sure you guys can think of what those are for you. Um, but they're not something that came off of a spreadsheet of features, probably. There's, it's a product that somebody actually iterated over time, I'm quite sure, if you think about what that is, that that's probably the case. If you, and then another thing, the last thing I want to say about this is, Iterate tightly on the parts customers interact with the most. Like for us, that's going to be a trigger and a button. That's where you should put most of your effort, or you can miss the opportunity to ship these products that people will actually love. And get this, the trackpad on the MacBook, just the piece of glass. There we go. The trackpad on the MacBook took 50 iterations to get the feel right up. And I'm just talking about the etch, the chemical etch on the glass itself, 50 different batches of chemicals so that when it came out and you rubbed your finger across it, it felt right. And has anybody ever gone from a MacBook to a non-MacBook computer and noticed the difference in the trackpad? Yes? That's why. If it's too glossy, your finger kind of slips over it. Um, if it's too rough, you really notice. And so I'm going to talk about synesthesia oh, just for a second. Synesthetic. Um, products are kind of things that like, there's something ineffable, there's something undefinable about it. And my favorite, I love trains. And so I love the Zurich airport, because if you go into the Zurich airport, you go downstairs, you get on the train, it's so quiet and stable, it just whisks you away. You don't even hear the train. You don't even hear the doors closing. Um, it took someone so much work to make that train quiet. They knew to value smoothness, they sound as part of the experience. Um, it makes kind of coming around the bend when the city comes into view with the mountains behind it that much more impressive. 
And this commitment to the holistic experience, this level of iteration, uh, makes all the difference. So these are the things that contribute to this synesthetic feel of the experience. Make sure you give yourself time to get them right. So a lot of people know these rules. They're not mine alone. I am here to tell you, though, far too many people don't actually apply them, and you have to apply them rigorously. If all else fails, go back to where you started. Why are you building this product? Who is it for? Stay focused on user experience. Finally, and this is critical, prototyping is supposed to be really fun. If it's not fun, you're doing it wrong. So free your engineers to come up with things. There should be a grand excess of cool ideas. After you've popped the champagne to celebrate your successful ship, you can pick up the next great product from your cutting room floor. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to First Round for sharing my, my rules of prototyping in an article earlier this year. Okay, let's take questions. I give you lots of time to think of your questions. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, uh, the first rule, define your non-negotiables. How do you figure out how many non-negotiables to define? And I'm just going to put you back into the speed caution slider. Where are you? What is the point of the product? If you want to beat a competitor to market, you probably can't have as many. So if you've got some kind of speed concern, you kind of be a little more rigorous about that. Um, it is also a good idea to batch, coders do this a lot, P0, P1, P2. It's a way to kind of be more granular about your goals. P0 is something that if you don't have the product can't ship, but then you kind of have a P1 or a P2 or a P3 tier, where it's like P3 might be nice to have, P1 must, might be, hey, we'd be willing to delay the product a week or two to get this right, something like that. So you actually don't have to be quite as black and white about it. Does that answer? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, for the new product process, when do you, as a PD lead, when do you need to say no? Because there's a time when you're, uh, right, there's the non-negotiables working through it, but then, you know, you're at your EVT stage and an executive says, I want this feature. And you say, it's a pink Corvette. Yeah. Because. I have a strategy. So the question is, how do you say no? And, if, and I think the question is, if an exec asks for something or somebody asks for something and it's kind of too late, you're past that that point in no return. I actually never say no about this stuff to executives. Just up front or? No, in general. Okay. I won't, there's no point, basically. You don't, I, I don't, this is just me, but I don't say no. I say, yes, we can do that. And it will take this many engineers and the product will delay this many months, and this is the impact, and these are the features we might lose because we're putting people from here to there. Do you, also, do you still want to do this? Yeah, and so like the, the thing about no is just it, it kind of ends the conversation and they kind of often are just like, do it anyway. So coming really prepared with a impact one, impact two, impact three, and especially if you can kind of look around corners and anticipate those questions, it's not that hard to kind of zoom out and be like, okay, what is my, what is my CEO or what is my customer going to ask for? Um, the other strategy is to say yes in the next revision, yes in the post-ramp call, Yes, in the next version of this, um, and just make sure they, they're willing to staff it and pay for it. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Yes? I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that story you mentioned, uh, how the product has merged in terms of what seems like one function. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested to hear when you have those trade offs where you have to like, decide are we pulling more and more function or pulling more um, to make sure we have all the sensors right. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. The question is about form and function, and I think the question is about when they disagree or when they're in conflict. How do you proceed, basically? And I think that you go back to user experience. I always go back to user experience. How is the user impacted if we have to make this part wider in order to accommodate this flex? What is the impact on the final user experience? And if you zoom out to that level, usually there's an 
impact to the consumer experience if you don't do it, which is one thing, and an impact if you do, which is another, and you weigh those versus each other, and you see what has the greater impact to the more sort of well-trodden parts of the product. Because sometimes you can say, okay, this will happen a lot. There's a feature that a consumer only uses 2% of the time, or only 2% of the consumers use it. Um, and then there's this other thing, which is maybe A, B buttons, that 50, 60% of customers are using in any given session. Um, there's a clear user experience win for when one is versus the other. And then sometimes you actually, I think, have to reset. If both are, if both are heavy, um, heavily affecting user experience, um, I would argue you may have to reset your assumptions and delay or rework the plan. And sometimes it just means instead of going up this way, you go up that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, stressing me out, just asking me. Oh, sorry about that. I'm no, sorry. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the question is, um, the very stressful question is, how do, you, uh, how do you handle having such a complex product? I mean, the Oculus Rift is, is got software, it's got mechanical, but it's also got to be tracked, both the headset and the controllers. Um, and also, because that wasn't hard enough, like a console, it's gotta go out to developers six months before you ship. So if you stack all of that on everything else, you get to an almost untenable product development cycle. And the way that you do solve that, if you figure that out now, um, um, I think that once, you had, once we had the Rift done, it's a lot easier. We have a proof of concept, we have our zero to one, and we can modify this thing, which is what we're doing now, to figure out a lot of future things. But before you have that zero to one, you actually have to, I think, personally get a, ta get a tactical team together of people who are going to just relentlessly prototype that thing until it's right. In Rift, if you, if you don't have, these are things you have to have to know if VR works with Rift, the first version. Okay, ergonomics has to be right because the optical stack has to be the right distance from your eyes. The lens has to be right to give you your field of view. The displays have to be right and at the right location. Right, so that's table stakes, right? Then the tracking system has to be working. Then the experience inside has to be on and working, so the software has to be on. And if you don't have all those things going all at the same time, you don't, get to, you don't actually get to, to check it. So it's kind of the hardest possible case. I mean, not to pat ourselves on the back. It wasn't a high volume product um, in the sense of like an iPhone or something like that, like on that order of magnitude. But um, I think you just have to make it. And you have to get a few people in a room like four or five people, domain experts in a room together and say, don't come out until you have a prototype that's working. And maybe that sounds mean, but that's actually what works, so. <laughs> yeah, please. So I love the graph that you had with effort and essentially saying like you need the, the people working on it at the beginning versus scrambling at the end. Yeah. What if you're a, running a small startup and you can't no. necessarily pull everybody off what they're working on to do that, what would you recommend? Oh, not this one. Yeah, Hold the on. One. It's a, I, I want to talk in front of the graph because I want yeah, this one, right? So what do you do if you're a small startup? Well, you may not have more people, but those people have a certain number of hours, and you can think about their time in the same way. So, um, and I also think that, so for, for if you have money, if you're well-funded, you can outsource um, the things on the right, actually, and do in-house the early hard stuff. So there is a trade-off there. If you can, like, I always like to pay for easy work and to do the hard work ourselves. And so do our engineers. We, we all like to do that. And so if you can actually do that, that's great. If you can't, you actually work double time in the beginning as individuals and you wean off that crazy. It's basically like a sprint, right? Like there may be a marathon for the product. If you do the sprint in the beginning instead of in the end, it's just so much easier for everybody. So I would just look at people... Um, not as you know, one or a zero, but as a lot of ability to do work and, and figure out how much time they're spending and when. Good. Uh, the, the two different uh, two different articles of wisdom that you mentioned regarding number one, uh, you need to iterate extremely those high touch uh, points, yeah. buttons, things like that, uh, as well as the importance of not polishing until you're ready to sell. 
Yep. Those two things independently seem uh, like right to do. However, they do seem like they might conflict because those high touch points might be the aspects that are really polished. So how do you conflict it? Yeah, so what was the first piece? I'm, I got the, the second one. was, was uh, extreme iteration on high touch point. Oh, points. yeah. And then the second is don't polish until you're ready to sell. So uh, there's two separate things that maybe sound like the same thing. Polish is making it pretty yeah. and paying attention to the details that are not relevant to the thing that you're iterating heavily on. So like, let's talk about buttons, right? But the exact button position, like when we were doing the touch, we didn't have a place to, to rest your thumb. So you're kind of like always like this, which was pretty awkward and then hovering over buttons and stuff. And we realized we need a place to to set your thumb. And so what we had to do is move everything around. And so we had to iterate a ton on where all that stuff was going. If we'd also been polishing up the texture of the plastics and the tooling and the ring and everything else at the same time, we would have not been doing that right. So it's not, it's, it's about targeted focus. Does that make sense? Okay, right. cool. Please. I'm just interested in the documentation We don't do that very well. We don't document, so the question is about how do we document ourselves. We are, I think, generally classically quite bad, not just at Oculus, but in this field at documenting, self-documenting. I don't know if you guys saw the Apple, the big white Apple book. Do you see that? It was pretty cool. It was like all the Apple products ever. And nobody had those Apple products at Apple. They had to like buy them off of eBay. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of funny. Or like somebody had them in a garage or something and they had to pull them out for this book to get photographed. So we don't do that well. Um, do you videotape yourselves, photograph yourselves? Not usually, no. What, what, I, what I do do though is like, let's say you have a feature that like you iterated on and you did a bunch of work on, but it didn't make it in this product and you knew you were gonna put it in maybe the next product or might need it later. I actually asked the team to spend a few extra days documenting that. So get a bunch of, get a bunch of prototypes together, um, like print out some guidelines, design guidelines. Um, we had one product where we did a particular feature and actually had the lead write all the things that he learned before he moved on to something else for the next person who was just about to do it. So we do it tactically. We should do a much better job. We just don't, usually, unfortunately. So. Yes? So the software, especially in small startups, now everybody is kind of striving to, as quickly as possible, build their MVP, their infamous minimum viable product. But when you were talking about the non-negotiables, I kind of had the feeling that you're talking about it from a slightly different angle, or at least applying slightly <coughs> different standards of values to it than just this minimum viable feature set. Yeah. I think that the minimum viable feature set idea is going back to that Excel spreadsheet of things that the product does, which is kind of where products go to die. You know, it's like, really, like it's like a, the marketing list of the things that the product should be Oh, it's got to have this resolution, this and that. Like it might make sense to folks like on a Reddit board somewhere who are like looking at you know this product versus that product. No offense to Reddit, Reddit's awesome. Um, but like realistically, the it's crazy. Like for me, it's crazy. Like people are really into resolution on VR systems, but like ergonomics is like much more important actually than detailed resolution in a lot of ways for your VR experience. Field of view is much more important. If you don't know that, and you're just seeing a list. We do that when we're developing new products that we don't know well. I think a minimum viable product is kind of like connected to that list and it doesn't really affect, it doesn't really uh, dial into this customer experience that I'm talking about. So a better goal, a non-negotiable goal is I can wear this for two hours. I can see a full movie without my, head, my neck getting tired. That's a good goal. A bad goal is like it should be 2075 DPI, whatever. Like, I don't think that's a good goal. I think it should be experience-based, which is much more fundamental. I don't know if that answers. Thanks. Yeah. Yes? This is a much more broad question um, in terms of where we're going in the future, but as AI comes into our lives every day, we have design being done by AI in a way that we couldn't really fathom before. So for instance, as mechanical engineers, there's a bracket that holds three cables together. And it's a pretty simple design uh, process, but the AI does it with 25% uh, less material or 75% less material, then throws it straight to a 3D printer, 
No humans involved, except for the initial parameters. Can you send me the details of that system? <laughs> I'm, I've seen it theoretically. I haven't actually seen that done. So then on the other end of the spectrum, you have playwrights or, 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 yeah. or scripts that are written by AI. AI has sifted through thousands of, of uh, playwrights and has made one on its own, and humans can't tell the difference. And so as this propagates into product design, you're going to get to a situation, in theory, where companies don't need to hire people like you or me, but you're, we're not the same, but people like yeah, us people in the room. Have been and so as, but you've moved from Apple to the previous company that was in the mission. That we don't remember because the product right? wasn't awesome. Okay. <laughs> so... You, there's all this cross-contamination and collaboration, and you bring with you, despite Apple wanting to keep all its all its um, intel inside, you bring with you a lot of a lot of product knowledge. So if AI becomes a company's main source of design, is innovation actually going to be stifled, or will it grow? Yeah. What's the deal with that? So it's a great question, and I think that. <laughs> no, I'm just going to tell you it's a great question and make you guess what it is. Thank you. Let's see. Um, so the question is about AI, and it's basically about how as AI, I can have, as AI gets better and better and better, like AI can already take on some design tasks. Um, and the question is, uh, will it kind of replace, start to replace us? Um, and uh, what my thoughts are on that. Is that fair? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that that's a really interesting question. However, you know, about 30 years ago, execs were like, okay, we're going to be able to actually finally ship this, these designers, these pesky, expensive, annoying, take forever designers. We're going to actually be able to finally do this in ODMs. We're not going to have to, we're not going to have to do this anymore in house. We're not going to have to do it in the US anymore. And so what they did basically was like, okay, you're going to train your replacement. I said, seriously. And people were training their replacement. And then when it came down to it, the designs, you know, super, super capable. I mean, we, we could not do what we do without ODM engineers, but the elegance of very difficult interdependent technical solutions does not come out of that model. It doesn't actually work. And so my argument would be, at least in my lifetime, I don't believe that's actually going to work. Yeah, so I'm safe. No. But I, I don't believe that that's actually gonna work because you have to give parameters to the system and tell it what to solve for. The AI that I've seen do design is like, okay, you've got these contact surfaces and you've got this much volume, how do you wanna brace this bracket, right? But that takes a whole lot of input from us. Yeah. And so I think while you may, sorry FEA engineers, you may be able to kind of take a percentage of those folks off your team, the actual um, interdependent creative complex work that has never been done before is never going to be done by computers. Last question. Last question. Please. When you're a prototyping, uh, how much do you trust your instincts versus how much do you ask for feedback from customers early on? Yeah, so uh, the question is how much when you're prototyping do you trust your instincts and how much do you try to do uh, check with your customers? Because of the nature of this industry, we don't go to customers with early stuff almost ever. And when we do, we've got to be really clever about it. Um, I think it depends on who we're talking about. If you've done a bunch of this thing that you're making and you have a gut feel, um, I tend to, high, to oh, maybe overvalue it. I tend to value gut feels very highly. But sometimes you can use a gut feel that you have from one place to apply to another place and it doesn't actually work that well. So I would say it depends on, the, like, with these touch controllers, I didn't do the design. Like, I led and managed the team that, that did this detailed design. And actually, the design studio that we have in Seattle um, in Soto did most of this work with ID. Um, there are some folks who've worked on controllers before. Their gut feel for button stack and all of that, I, I value a lot. So it just depends on how calibrated you are. Um, but I will kind of over-index maybe on gut feel in general. And I think an engineer that has a good uh, mechanical sense if they have a concern, as their manager, I re get really worried when they're like, I don't feel like this is right. So pay attention. So do you think you can lose your focus when you're asking for feedback from customers too early on? Do you need to trust yourself if you feel like you've got the expertise? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have an Apple answer here, but I actually believe it. Um, and I don't believe all of the things that Apple says about this stuff, but I do believe that customers don't really know what they want in, in a new product category. I think they know what they want if they've had an iPad for five years and they're like, man, if only this had, had this thing. But if they've never tried something before, they're not usually right. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was really interesting, thank you. All right, a few things. Um, is it possible to switch back to the lighter background? It feels really dark. Um, okay, a few things. One is our uh, next event is uh, September 27th. I'm welcoming a returning guest here, uh, Sami Inkinen, who is the founder of Trulia, a world-class athlete, and now founder of a company that's set out to end uh, diabetes. So he's almost not human, uh, but he's a great guy. And um, he's going to talk about how uh, AI uh, will end uh, diabetes and will disrupt healthcare. So um, I hope to see you next month. The thing we're going to do now is we're going to do shout out. So shout out our um, quick sessions where you get 10 seconds to talk about something that's important for you, whether you have a project, you're looking for users, a company, you're looking for um, employees, uh, maybe you're looking for a job, looking for funding, looking for customers, whatever it is. So if you have a shout out you wanna do, it's one of our super popular sessions. So please line up here. Please somebody lines up first. Okay, so everybody can follow. Um, thank you very much. Um, while, uh, while people uh, start lining up, and, and please do that, please don't wait <laughs> to do that. Um, one thing that you have in your inbox right now is a survey. This survey we sent to you because we treat our programs the way we treat products. We want to make sure that you know, we make them better and better all the time. And so if you take a minute to answer that survey, we use that to calculate a net promoter score, we use that to give Caitlin feedback. We use that to make our events better. Uh, super important for, for us to have that feedback. Another thing I want to share is, is, is Loan here? Loan, please come over here. And then if, uh, if all of the volunteers who helped make tonight happen could stand up. So, Loan has been uh, leading all of our volunteer teams for the past two years, every month here, and she's graduating tomorrow, right? Okay, that's a, an amazing leader, so I'm so happy that she's here. All right, so shout outs. Can you guys get present when you do a shout out? Hi, everybody. I'm doing this for the present. I'm Seamus, I'm with Bullpine Blue. Uh, we're just putting together a, a, a new workshop this Monday. So if, you have, if you're running a team, especially if you're based in software and hardware, and you have teams that are distributed, uh, whether it be culturally or geographically, we can help you work better together in the context of being our client, but also in the context of just coming in, talking with other people in similar uh, uh, environments, and seeing what they've, uh, how they've solved similar problems to you. So come with me, and I'll give you information. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Miller. I work at Flipboard as a product manager, and we are looking for uh, data analysts. So if you are looking for a job as a data analyst for Flipboard, uh, please, um, I guess I'll, I'll be around, and uh, come see me. Thank you. Any more shout outs? All right, okay, shout outs, please come over here. There's always a little moment of like, anybody wants to do a shout out, please come over here. Hi everyone, I am the founder of jollywe.com and we help improve communication between couples. I'm currently hiring for a product person. Most of our team is actually based in Taiwan and the Philippines, so you'd be one of the few people in San Francisco and with possible travel to Asia. So if you're interested, um, please reach out to me. I'll be around. Thank you. And also, if you're interested in just signing up, um, if you're yeah, part of a couple that you would like uh, some weekly uh, frameworks and exercises to improve your relationship, it's jollywee.com. So J-O-L-L-Y-W-E.com. Thank you. 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 Th
www.yywe.com. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Johnson, and uh, I'm, I build products that help everybody uh, expand their access to information, tools, and resources they need to be super successful. So uh, I moved to San Francisco uh, just about a year ago uh, to pursue that same vision. We, me and three friends, we built this engine that helps anybody have access to the information they need to make uh, good decisions on the stock market. And currently, I pay the bills by working at a company called Everwise, where we have built a social learning platform that expands access for everybody to get the tools and resources they need to be successful in their careers. I am currently looking for new avenues to connect with people and with opportunities um, where I get to realize that vision. So if you feel like that we might be in simpatico, please come reach me. Um, I'd love to connect with you and speak with you. I'll be somewhere back there. Cheers. Hi everyone, my name is Pooja. I'm a producer at a UX design firm called Design Map. So we're actually here to um, to work with, I guess, actually to meet other people in products. We like solving complex problems. We're located in the mission. So if you want to talk to us, there's a few folks back there from Design Map. So come say hi. Hi, my name is Leo. Um, we just formed a new company to do structural design and packaging. So if you need packaging, uh, talk to me. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. So remember, fill out the survey, beer and pizza, more networking. We close at 9 o'clock sharp because Yelp is such an awesome partner. We want to be good to them. See you next month. <laughs>